Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy and the long-awaited part 4 of Mustang Madness. When that series concluded, I still owed you an Edward Mustang. And thanks to my friend Mark over at Hobby Not Models, I'm finally able to fully conclude that series. If you're looking for a simple way to recreate wood textures for a scale model, one very simple technique is to start with a light beige color using acrylic paints and then just putting an oil paint on top of it, preferably a raw umber or a burnt umber, and then streaking it out with a sponge. And what that's going to do is give you some random streaking effects on top of the wood and give it a natural look. And then just to take that effect a little bit further once it's dried, I'll take a yellow clear from Tamiya and lock everything down. And that'll change that from a dull brown color to a little bit of a richer color. And the nice thing about having that lacquer on top is you can come in with a chipping fluid and not have to worry about damage to the paint underneath. One thing I've found about building bubble top aircraft like the Mustang, Thunderbolt, and the FW190 is that it allows you access to see a lot more of the cockpit detail. So what you'll find is your eye is naturally drawn there, especially if it's a Mustang and it's got a silver surrounding. You're really going to want to take time to make the colors inside pop and put some more effort in there because it's going to be a focal point of the aircraft, whether you like it or not. Even something as simple as a pin wash can really help your cockpit come to life and have some more depth to it. Edward has done a great job replicating the office of the Mustang and there's a lot of details here that you can pick out and really go to town with. So don't be afraid to spend some time here. Even if you only pick up a weekend edition of this kit, there's still a lot of detail in that cockpit and you're not really missing out if you don't have the photo etch to go with it. Back to the cockpit floor, now that it's had time to dry and it's been sealed with a clear coat, I'm going to put down some acrylic rubber black on top. And after that's had a few minutes to dry, I'm going to come in, re-wet it, and start chipping it with a stiff brush. And the idea here is I don't want to really beat this floor up. I just want some light scuffing from where the pilot's feet would be rubbing. One thing I've really learned in the last year and a half, really trying to push myself with modeling, is to make sure my weathering tells a story and then it's not just random. It's very easy just to chip a floor or a wing root right up and just really go to town on the model. But if it doesn't make sense, you're not really effectively weathering the aircraft. And what I mean by that is you want it to have character and you want to build that character by having the model tell a story. Now, I'm not saying that the model itself has to tell an actual story, but by looking at certain parts of the aircraft, a person can look at it and start to understand why it's the weather the way it is. Maybe the crew chief likes to rest on the cowling a certain way, or maybe they're using a screwdriver to pop open a hatch, or maybe there's some screws that they really have trouble with loosening up, or they've dropped a hammer or something like that when they're refueling the aircraft. There's lots you can do to add that character to a model. Just don't weather the entire thing and expect it to make sense. Take some time to plan, and even better, find some reference photos that you can look at while building the model. That doesn't mean you have to copy your reference photo stroke for stroke, but it gives you an idea of what you can do to the aircraft and still be believable. I wanted this model to be even more accurate to the Mustang, so that meant filling in the panel lines. That was something that they did on the actual Mustang to make the wing more efficient. Having just done the Tempest and used sprue goo, I decided that was going to be the best way to fill in these panel lines. However, it wasn't as simple as slapping on sprue goo and then sanding it off. It actually took a few applications of the sprue goo and a few rounds of sanding. And once I thought I was done, I would come in with a primer coat of Mr. Surfser 1000. I had to repeat this process three or four times before the model was ready for primer. The problem was, after I applied the primer the first time, there was still some imperfections that showed up. Little parts of the seam hadn't been fully filled, so I had to come in fill it again, reprime, and keep sanding until it was super flush. And the aircraft was actually in paint fully once, and I found some more imperfections on the wing that I wasn't happy with. So I ended up stripping the model completely down to the plastic and starting on the seams again. That was only half the battle because once everything was super smooth, I then had to come in and re-scribe the gun bays where the putty had seeped in just a tiny bit in the panel line. And there was definitely a pucker factor making sure that I didn't cut into the putty because then I would have been filling and sanding again. I'm using some Tamiya sanding sponges for this, but afterwards I ended up picking up some Infinity sanding sponge packs. That way it was stiffer and it probably made this process go a little bit quicker, but I'll know that for next time. 
The nice thing about sprue goo is because it's made of the same material as the styrene plastic of the kit is that instead of just covering up a seam, it actually melts it and becomes part of it. So it's great for filling cracks. In the past, I've used putties to fill cracks and seam lines. The only problem is it doesn't fully bond to the plastic. And if you flex the wing by accident, you may pop that seam back open, which means you need to stop and repair your previous repair. That doesn't mean though that putty doesn't have its place. If you're filling somewhere that has lots of detail around it that you don't want to lose, that's an ideal place to use putty, especially like inner wing roots and things like that. Now after a few hours of filling, sanding, priming, repeat, I'm ready to move on to paint. One of my biggest challenges with building models is doing a natural metal finish. And even with Mustang Madness having built four natural metal Mustangs in a row, I was still having problems getting the finish I wanted. The problem is if you fire down a nice polished aluminum paint, as soon as you hit it with a clear coat, it loses its luster and then it just looks like silver paint instead of metal. So having done some research and watching some other videos on how people were doing this, I decided that I was going to try Mr. Metal Colors and try the new Mr. Color SM line and then seal it with a different clear coat, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This process starts the same way as the B Mustang I built last year. The only difference is the colors that go on top. So to get a nice glossy black base for my nice shiny metals, I do two thin coats of Mr. Color Uno Black, and once it's tacky, come in with a wet coat and reapply. And once that's had a few minutes to dry, basically long enough to clear your brush, I come in with a wet coat of Mr. Leveling Thinner. And the whole idea there is that the Mr. Leveling Thinner melts down that color even more and gives you a nice shiny smooth surface. You'll definitely want to give this a few hours to dry though and I let my model sit overnight before coming back with the metals. It won't hurt to spend a few minutes here checking for any imperfections because they're a lot easier to clean up now than they are when the color's on. The real P51 Mustang, after having its wings puttied and sanded, would have the wings covered with a couple coats of silver lacquer. Now trying to find a proper silver lacquer color is almost as hard as finding a good polished aluminum color because you want something that has a little bit of a luster but stands out from the polished aluminum, the natural metal on the aircraft. So to do that I used Tamiya's LP70 gloss aluminum. Thinned down with some Mr. Leveling Thinner, this went down very smooth and it only took a few light coats. If you're wondering why I started with the wings and not the fuselage, it's because that Tamiya lacquer paint, I've used it before and I know it's very durable and can take some abuse. And the super metals from Mr. Color, I've only used once or twice, so I didn't want a chance masking on top of those more than I had to. Any time I spent worrying about how durable the super metallic paints were from Mr. Color was a little bit of a waste because in the end, once it was under two layers of all clad aqua gloss, which is an acrylic clear, nothing lifted. That was a great experience because when I used the AK Extreme Metals last year, especially the polished aluminum, I found that it was very delicate and even letting it dry for a week, it still had a tendency to lift. So I think that Super Metallics is going to be my go to for metal colors. If there's one takeaway from all of my rambling in this video, it's that you shouldn't be afraid to try to do something a different way. Just because something's working for you and you may think that, hey, if it's not broken, don't fix it, doesn't mean that you may not find an easier way to do it or something that's more rewarding. So don't get stuck in a rut. Why don't you take a moment and write in the comments section below, what is something that you've been doing and have been trying different ways to do before you finally fell on something that you enjoyed? I know for some people it's pigment approach, some people it's oils, Write in the comment section. We'll, I'll try to reply to as many as I can and we'll have a fun laugh. Moving back to the model, one great feature of the Super Metallics from Mr. Color is that you can polish them to quite the sheen. Now being happy with the metal color for the base, it was then time to add some more interest by picking some panels and changing the colors on them. If you look at any reference photos of a Mustang, even the natural metal areas have some different tones going on. I tried to recreate this by using Mr. Metal Colors Aluminum and then by using AK's Aluminum and Polished Aluminum on different panels. With all the metal painting now complete, I seal everything in with two coats of Aqua Gloss Clear. Then it's time to move on to the colors. 
You'll notice right away that I'm not doing my normal process of sandwich shading the colors where I come in with a regular color, different colors, tones, break it all up and then blend it. Instead, I'm just coming in with the color and then I'm going to try to break that up using oils later because this model, the goal was to really push my oil technique before moving on to the Corsair. So in the timeline of things, this build was actually done before the Corsair as a test bed. So in short, I'm keeping painting very simple with this kit. Edward calls us out for Insignia Red for this Mustang. However, I found Mr. Color's C385 Japanese Red had a little more of a pop to it and looked a little more flashy and just fit the overall look of this Mustang. Yellow can be a notoriously hard color to airbrush, and in order to make things a little bit easier, I'll actually lay down a white undercoat before applying the yellow color. What looked like an easy paint job to do actually ended up being a little more difficult as it required a lot of masking and measuring and retaping to get everything nice and straight, especially where the yellow and red lines meet up on the outer wingtips. For the tail markings, I ended up using my silhouette machine and just cutting some even stripes. I put them all down and then removed the offset ones to get that nice diagonal pattern. The red color that I'm using is also very thin and required a white undercoat in order for it to go down evenly and some very thin coats to build up the color. I created the insignia masks for the wings and fuselage and the squadron codes using my silhouette machine and a few weeks ago I put out a video on how to do that. So if you're not familiar with it, feel free to check that out and find out how your silhouette machine can help you save money on decal setting solution. In other builds where I've attempted to have a natural metal finish, I've always found that the insignia colors and don't like to stay on top of the paint. When you mask on top of them, they end up pulling away. But I wanted to see if having that aqua gloss clear coat on top would make a difference. I thought the paints would be a little more successful biting into that. They definitely didn't like sticking to the Mr. Metal colors. Removing masks is definitely one of my favorite parts of building a model. It's just so satisfying. Another added benefit of painting on your markings on natural metal finish is you don't have to worry about carrier film showing up around the marking. I'm not going to lie, I imagine this is what heroin probably feels like. After doing some testing with the Edward decals, I found the most successful way to be able to peel that film off was to, on top of that clear coat, put down some Mr. Mark setter, put down the decal just like you normally would, squeeze it down with a q-tip get all the air out of it and then follow up with some Mr. Mark softer and then to leave that decal for 24 hours. After 24 hours I could come in with a toothpick give it a little bit of nudge to try to pull up the carrier film and then peel it away slowly. And another technique I've seen people use and what actually worked as well was to put some tape on top of it. And this is a very tedious yet trying moment because if it goes wrong you basically have to strip that decal off. But the added benefit is if you can pull the carrier film off, it looks like it's painted on. Now to break up the colors, as I stated earlier, I didn't do any real marble coating on the rest of the markings on the aircraft. And I came with some oil paints to try to do some oil paint rendering. And for the most part, it was somewhat successful. I just feel like I didn't use enough of a contrasting color, so it doesn't really pop. But it is a learning experience and again, something I was able to take forward to the Corsair. One area where it did work was on the green of the cowling. Once the oil paint was on, I just came in with a dry brush to blend that. The biggest problem here, and one that I couldn't figure out a way to fix, was to get oils down on top of the natural metal areas because where it was a gloss coat, the oils just wanted to slide off. And the catch-22 there was, if I put a flat coat down, like I said earlier, then the natural metal just looks like silver paint and I've kind of ruined the effect I'm going for. So if you have any tips for doing oil paint rendering on natural metal, please let me know so I can try it. In the meantime, I'll just be waiting for Mike Rinaldi to do it on his channel. And if you haven't checked him out, he's got some great live videos on doing works with oils and pigments. Even as an aircraft guy, I find that stuff very helpful. We just need Mike to hurry up and do a plane. That's going to bring this episode to a close. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I just wanted to give a shout out to my patrons for helping support this channel behind the scenes. There are several different tiers you can sign up for, for one week early videos, ad free, or 
24 hour early videos ad free or you can even just get the high def photos and blog posts behind the scenes if you're financially unable to do that that's fine you can just check that you've had that subscribe button clicked and you've hit the bell to get all notifications for the channel that's it for now i am the model guy and i'll see you next time